Martin, the newsmakers, for inside analysis and behind the scenes commentary from Santa Barbara's top journalists about the most important news events in our community. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts. Tonight, we look behind these headlines. City Hall's abuzz with a tale of two parking lots, one for a big homeless project and the other for a new cop shop. Mayor Kathy Murillo takes a page from Donald Trump's book and moves to silence her loudest critic. As winter weather, not to mention climate change, arrive, lawmakers look to beef up emergency warning communication systems. And wealthy leaders of the secretive Bella Squardo Estate Board offer the first hints about what they plan for us peons. Our panel tonight, Nick Welsh, executive editor of the Santa Barbara Independent, political reporter Josh Molina, Catherine Barnes, producer for KCRW-FM, and Tyler Hayden, news editor of The Independent. Thank you all for coming. So, Nick, our elected leaders are enraging everyone who shops at the farmer's market while simultaneously infuriating neighbors and commuters with sudden news about a 40-unit homeless project. What is the tale of two parking lots? The tale of two parking lots kind of broke uh, last week where... It's actually been building. Last week, we found out um, that the Housing Authority of Santa Barbara and the city and College Hospital were going to put 40 what they call tiny homes, uh, which are 120 square foot uh, trailers, essentially, at the uh, commuter parking lot at Carrillo and Castillo Streets. And this would be transitional housing uh, for the the most you know high vulnerability. Uh, service resistant homeless people who wind up going to the ER, going to jail, getting arrested, getting, um, you know, sort of re repeat hardcore offenders. Um, but the neighbors didn't know about it. And, and, and the neighbors didn't know about it. And so the neighbors found out about it uh, with a notice on their doors on Saturday, two weeks ago, Saturday afternoon. The council meeting was on Tuesday. The vote uh, that you know for a grant application that was had to be submitted by that Friday, so that's all last week. Now I mean, so at that point it was a six point five million dollar project. It was actually quite creative and ambitious. What's the second parking lot? The second parking lot. You don't want to hear about this parking no, lot. No, we'll go back <laughs> to this. One. You don't want to hear about this parking we'll lot. We'll go back to this. The one. second parking lot is is, is Coda Street parking lot, um, where the farmers market takes place and. So the city is, needs a new police station. The old one was built in 1958, 59. It is a, is a nightmare. They've needed it fixed for a long time, so they want to put a new parking lot somewhere. Where? We don't know, so they look at nine places. They say, oh, we've got two places out of nine that make sense. One's the Coda Street lot, and one's the Louise Lowry Davis, where they do the lawn bowling. That one is... Really, of, of the two, there's only one, and that's the Coda Street lot. And because the, the lawn bowling lobby is so powerful? Because the lawn bowling <laughs> lobby is all powerful. This is Santa Barbara, the home of the nearly wed and the newly dead. So that is, but it's actually more complicated than that. There would have to be an election um, to, al to allow the lawn bowling site to be used for anything um, other. But not, not to displace the farmer's market. But not to displace the farmer's market. So that, that really makes it it's going to be the farmer's market. They haven't announced that. They're not going to announce it, but that's the deal. Farmer's market, that's three to 5,000 people a week go there. And that's a religious sort of shopping experience and, and communal experience for a whole lot of people in town. And to find out so abruptly without a lot of advance warning and hand-holding uh, was really kind of not the way to do it. Right. And is this typical, Josh, of the city council? Is it not? Uh, and I think you'll agree with me that uh, just blindsiding neighbors and not getting building community support for projects is, is pretty typical. Uh, well, I don't know if it's typical, but it's exactly what they did with these two sites. Uh, they did not notify them that tiny homes for the homeless was part of what was being considered with this grant. If you could go look up the staff report, it does not mention it. It's only in a PowerPoint that was presented at the meeting. Uh, as far as the farmer's market, there was, you know, same thing. People were blindsided. And you can get a lot done if you do outreach, you start early, you build support, you work with people, you get them to buy into what's happening. And City of Santa Barbara, 
for the most part, does things well when it comes to that, but they certainly drop the ball in both of these instances. The farmer's market is not just, let me go buy a few strawberries and apples no. and kale. When you go down there, you see people you know, it's you talk, you chit-chat, and it is a melting pot. You have families, you have senior citizens, you have young people. It's, it's a really kind of a fun experience. So they're going to try to recreate that somewhere else. And uh, we'll see how that happens. Have they talked about other lots where they could have the, the farmer well, market? One of the lots they talked about is Santa Clara Plaza. That's that's um, probably the, the number one contender, I think, right now. They've talked about Louise Lowry Davis, hmm. maybe there. Um, they've talked about um, there is a lot, lot 11, which is down by Chapala and Santa Barbara Streets. No, Haley and Santa Barbara Streets. Um, but what about the parking? I mean, they are going to do away with the parking lot. Well, they will lose the parking lot. The, the closed street lost about 325 spaces, and that's significant. Yeah. Um, there are other, what's interesting, we hear all the time how Santa Barbara is, is so dramatically underparked, we don't have enough parking. But the reality is, like, a lot of the lots are 50% occupied during the course of the day. I don't think that that is an insurmountable problem, it's, a, it's an issue. Um, they will have to find other places, but I, I've been told that if you did an inventory of all the lots, there's enough empty spaces that you could accommodate. So going, going back to the tiny homes, I, I understand that you think on the merits this is a really good idea because it gets to the, to the issue of people who are re using a lot of services right. repeatedly and, and so on, at least addresses that. But w is there organized opposition in the neighborhood, or will there be? Uh, at this it's kind point, of a weird... Uh, well, at this point, the, the project is sort of uh, in abeyance. There's a huge question mark. It was a $6.5 million proposal. They just got a $2 million grant. So they have to figure out how to cut it into so a third. So it's back to square one. So it's not back to square one, but maybe square two. Um, I think if, if they could get 22 tiny homes, they would be thrilled. There was a meeting last night, uh, Wednesday night, uh, at the Louise Lowry Davis, all roads lead there, it seems. Um, and it was packed. And it was Santa Barbara karaoke political culture at its finest. I mean, it was, everybody got up there, and, and for the most, there were a couple of wing nuts who went off. But people were really on, on point, on target, and there were people... Can we get them on the show, do you think? Uh, <laughs> they may be here. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, people spoke passionately and eloquently like why this was a great idea and why this was a, a great idea but for someplace else at another time. Yeah. All right. Well, these are both going to be ongoing, obviously, for yeah. some time. Could they turn the police station into a parking lot once they move out of there? Ooh, you know what? Nice thinking. Hey, hey. Maybe a homeless shelter. Hey. 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 Maybe a, what a district tiny you lot. Oh. Maybe we could, maybe we could <laughs> get tired of it. We get tired of that, oh, that's, no. that's Greg Hart's district. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Let's, well, yeah, we'll talk about him. Okay. Josh, if you look up thin skin in the dictionary, you find a picture of Kathy Murillo, who's now clamping down on her most vociferous critic. Who is that and why is she doing this? I have not been this disappointed at a city council meeting since room 15 ran out of cookies when they were swearing in the new elected officials. On the day of the, uh, yeah, <laughs> on the no, day they, of they, the mudslides they, in they, Montecito. They yeah. always run out of cookies. By the time I'm done interviewing people, they're gone. And, uh, I, I actually, you know, I got up and I had to do some, some reporting after the meeting, but Basically, well, why don't you tell us more about that, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, why don't you next time? Why don't you start the show with me instead of me? But I digress. Too much background, Nick. So right? what are, the guts, so right? Anna Marie Gott? Isn't this really about Anna Marie Gott? That'll, so, that'll so, get your attention. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the the council eliminated the ability to pull time. So when you go to the council meeting. You can have Tyler, give me your two minutes of speaking time. Nick, Catherine, give me your two minutes. That's All kind of, of the way you're working on this uh, show anyway. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. right. I need 15 minutes, right? I don't care about anyone else. Okay, okay so, 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 so that was the way it had worked. And then the, the council, Kathy, at this, uh, uh, what was it, the, uh, the retreat that they had, they decided that they were going to limit this. They didn't decide. They talked about it. And then they decided at a meeting to limit 
uh, public comment, so no more pulling. You get three minutes max, that's you, you don't get to borrow other people's time. And this is done, in my opinion, as a total uh, re response to Anna Marie Gott, who's a, an activist at City Hall. She is the only one uh, who and recently, in the last six months, who routinely borrows time and spends six, eight, a couple times, ten minutes, where she'll talk during public comment. She does about. rant, but she has a lot of facts as well. Yeah, and she, you know, she talks at you. She doesn't talk to you, and she's very firm, and she doesn't. And she doesn't like Kathy. She's not sensitive about how she delivers her comments, and she does not like Kathy at all. And she said that publicly. Uh, what was interesting was that Kathy uh, said during the meeting. This does not have anything to do with anyone. Yeah, and person. she said it didn't have anything to do with Columbus Day too. When they, when they, when they changed that. <laughs> uh, and and she also said I agree with Anna Marie got fifty percent of the time, and it just felt like a very disingenuous statement because oh, there's a the, switch. The truth the truth is that that it was it was done exactly to stop her yeah. because she is the most vocal critic of the mayor. Um, she has been critical of other council members. Uh, the city administration, the city staff, the city attorney. Uh, and so they basically said, hey, we're going to limit her and punish everyone else. Not a lot of people full time, but the truth is, if somebody wants to go to City Hall next week and wants four minutes, they can't do it. Well, and there's a lot of people who have opinions who don't feel comfortable testifying yeah. and, and gave her their and, time. And, and, and the truth is, the people who, Kat, who uh, Anna Marie Goddard are speaking for, um, these aren't sort of people who don't feel comfortable speaking in front of a, a mic. These are people that she has come to the meeting. You have to be present to borrow someone's time. So these are people who come knowing this is just a way to increase Anna Marie's time. But my deal is that that's part of the deal. That's part of the game. Exactly. You're elected official. You should be able to put up with Anna Marie God or anyone else saying stuff. It, she's not there every week. She's probably there three out of four meetings. And uh, that's what she does. And now everybody is punished because she has been vocal in her criticism. And yes, yes, she, she can be somebody who uh, she grates, grates on you, right? But that's part what? of being She's, elected official. She has legitimate points. You know, here's what I mean. I mean, I think it was just a really dumb move. You know, for an elected official to try to put the lid on public criticism at this time in history, this is a bad look. A bad point that move. Oscar actually made. But I will say, I got a well. phone call nice. from Council Member Randy Rouse saying, I was pushing for this every bit as hard as Cassie Murillo, and we didn't want Wayne Scholes, and we didn't want um, Pete Dalbello, and other people who have sort of used it as sort of an open mic night. Um, I, I, I don't know if it was as exclusively Kathy versus Anne-Marie, but Anne-Marie, obviously, I, again, it's a, it's a really bad thing, but I, I listened to Anne-Marie, but after like three minutes, she's pretty much made her points. And after like three to four or five or six minutes, we're Which is of, certainly not true of any member of the city council. We just have like, it's hard to follow. But the, the truth is that I mean, I am at that, that council chamber every week. No one else does it. Pete Del Bello used to do it uh, about a year and a half ago, once in a while. Well, he did we're talking it actually more recently. Four, when was the last time Pete's been at City Hall? He's since, not been at City since Hall. Since after All she right. was elected. Right. But my, Captain, my, my, do you my, agree with me? <laughs> <laughs> On what? <laughs> Just yes. Pretty much Just everything. <laughs> Don't you agree with me that this is this is the most heinous censorship, anti First Amendment movement since Donald Trump banned Jim Acosta from the White House press room? Wow, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if I go does. that far, but but it seems like the the balance could have been that there was a, a maximum, like a limit of maybe six minutes. That's what they did. They did do six, but so, it's so three. she can talk no, to no. That's four, right? It's, no, no, it's two different things. Oh, I yeah, am yeah. the expert on this issue. <laughs> uh, allow me to mansplain. <laughs> okay, yeah, so the, t the stuff that's not on the agenda, oh, right. three minutes. Something that is on the agenda, tiny homes, the HEAP grant, five minutes max. You still have to have somebody in the room to borrow that time. As a practical matter, Jerry, the meetings are not longer because Don't of Don't throw Anna. my cliches in my <laughs> face. <laughs> the meetings are not longer because of Anna Marie 
I got. She's the only one who does it regularly. Uh, SEIU did it. They spoke for 57 minutes Oof. recently, okay? But that was a one-time thing. Yeah, but then they give campaign contributions too, so, so but that's she's okay. The, she's, the, she's the only one. A better way, right, what I think people expect from their elected officials is, hey, Anna Marie got, let's sit down, let's talk, let's figure out a way that we can meet in the middle so you don't have to come here every week Those days and are over. yell at us. Those and days that's are not over. what's happening. Didn't, didn't Freeman despot. make the point that other jurisdictions like the county or Carpinteria, Goleta, they don't allow right. full time, right? So the city's kind of just joining with the norm for other other councils. Yeah, and on one hand, so he's using right. that to say, well, Goleta doesn't. But on the other hand, Santa Barbara likes to say we're progressive, we do things our okay. own way. But yeah, that's the point Friedman said. Galita and Carpinteria don't allow it, yeah. so why should we? And the county doesn't allow it. Okay. It's, a bad, yeah. it's a bad look. Does anybody think it's not a bad look? Everybody. By the way, first time Oscar Gutierrez, in my memory, voted differently than Kathy Maria yeah. on this he issue. He made a good point. He made the Trump point first. That's where I got it from. So, did Kathy understand that? Or probably. Anyway, uh, so Catherine, uh, Hannah Beth and Monique uh, had a hearing in CARP this week mm -hmm. about expanding and improving emergency communications when disaster looms. What was your takeaway from that? Well, as we all know, there's disasters, it seems like, every day. And, and uh, this area has been hit with the Thomas Fire and then the mudslides. And uh, there's been fires up and down California the past year. So, so yeah, they held this hearing. It was one of a few different public hearings they've held around the state regarding this. And it's kind of just they were collecting information from various county officials all over the state about what their emergency uh, system looks like, emergency communication system looks like, what are the problems they're seeing, and then ways that they can address it. Um, so they spoke for four hours, speaking of long, long meetings. Um, and, and really, I think what the big issue is is that when these disasters happen, all of the ways that we typically communicate through the internet or through cell phone lines, I mean, none of those are completely reliable. So, so they're not only figuring out what are the best ways to communicate, so, but what happens if, if we can't rely on them. So in terms of the cell phones, there's, there's at least two issues, right? There's the, like the hardening of the infrastructure for mm -hmm. cell phones, but isn't there also that not everybody signed up, right? right. I mean, it's still a voluntary yeah. thing. Yeah, so in California, it's really, there's no statewide system. Every county does their own thing. And in Santa Barbara County, there's this aware and prepare system. You have to sign up your name, your number, your zip code, your address. You have to opt in. You have to opt in. And right now, I think about only 12% of county residents have opted in. Um, that's the whole county, so there, it is higher percentages in like the city of Santa Barbara and Montecito. It's a little bit higher, but um, it's still not really where they want to be. And, uh, and so, so there is some legislation that Senator Jackson is uh, trying to push through, and I think it will, will become law next year, which potentially will, will make it so that they can get information from cell phone companies, from utility companies, get phone numbers, and, and opt people in, or put people in the system themselves. How much of a factor was the the lack of people being signed up in the um, in the debris flow in the, in the fatalities. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I, if it's only twelve percent now, I'm sure it was even lower then. Um, though you don't necessarily have to be signed up to get a what's called a WIA alert. Um, that's a federal system that counties can sign up to use, um, and we signed up a couple years ago. So the people who who got like pretty much the the, the only um, like emergency alert in, in the midst of the debris flow was a, was a wee alert. And some people didn't get that for some reason, like Verizon didn't, didn't broadcast was it. Was that it. the one that came late? Yeah, that one was like after, kind of after the fact or in the middle of it, really. So, um, yeah, I mean, as Catherine said, it's, it, every county's kind of wrestling with how, how best to do this because there's no, there's no master playbook yet. And people have their own sort of systems of how to get the information from the field to, to their emergency managers. I thought what was interesting, from, I think it came from San Diego, the, the San Diego emergency manager. She was saying that everything, all cities and, and all jurisdictions, they, they go through basically her and her office. So there's a single point person um, who, who's making sort of the, the final decisions on what message goes out and what it says. Right now we have kind of a, a weird patchwork of, of different systems, different jurisdictions. I mean, the city's got its own emergency system. Goleta does actually too. The county does. So. Um, I think 
what, what I th found most interesting was sort of streamlining and simplifying would be would be the best. Also, San Diego gets people to sign up by giving out free tacos. Ooh. Oh, well, there you go. And lift rides. That, I oh, thought that's was brilliant. a good idea. Donuts, yeah. Yeah. yeah, whatever. Yeah. So, my, I mean, I mean my biggest ahead. takeaway with this was, was that it, it seemed like governments are struggling to work with cell phone companies to really get the information that they need. Uh, whether that's, you know, why didn't people get this message, this we alert, you know, who didn't get it, and then how can we not only opt these people in, but um, but work with the cell phone companies to maybe geolocate people. So maybe someone, you know, you don't actually, they're, they don't live in Montecito, they're visiting Montecito. This mudslide comes and their cell phone knows that they're in Montecito, and so they get that alert. Maybe there's some ways that the government can work with cell phone companies to do that, but right now, uh, as far as Robert Lewin from the Office of Emergency Management was talking about, they are, they're having a really hard time talking to these cell phone companies to get any information. Because they don't want to give up the information because there's a privacy issue or because they're, it costs money or because they don't want to be regulated? Or all Probably of the one in three. I, I, yeah, I think it, it would be that they don't want to be regulated or that they don't want, that right now that there's no, there's no uh, requirement that the government's asking these cell phone companies information and they have to give it up. And it probably would take a long time to compile this kind of information. But unless there's some kind of exchange, we rely on our cell phones. And if, and if they're not getting to our cell, these, these alerts aren't getting there, then there needs to be some So that, I mean, that's, that's really the whole game is, that, is cell phones and cell service. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not any, any other alternatives. Because you can't rely on the internet at that, this time. And I mean, the other, the other kind of school of thought that I've heard from um, the executive director of Direct Relief, Thomas Tig, he thinks it should be, you know, super old school. Like there should be neighborhood leaders and like sounding alarms that go off when there's a disaster. And we shouldn't be relying on tech because that can, you know, be destroyed in an instant. But really, we should be like super grassroots about it. And the county is restarting its radio ready program. Um, so it's basically there's a bunch of stations that's, that opt in or sign up with the county. And then during an emergency, they all broadcast the county messages about evacuations, warnings, and stuff. So, and I mean, that, that seems like a, a reliable method, too. You just need fresh yeah, batteries radio, and a radio. It's radio like, is it is, it's old everybody. school, but it's, it seems like, uh, you know, you don't need Wi-Fi for that. Nah. Jerry, that, Jerry, that was an amazing triple barrel question. Thank you. Regulation, cost, <laughs> privacy. Can you remember three things? Yeah. Well, I just, I wasn't sure if you were I used to aware. be a, I used to be a reporter. I don't know. Don't, don't, don't you teach them not to? To do the triple barrel question, allow them to answer one. No, <laughs> no, I don't. All right, Tyler, uh, you scooped the first hints of what the secretive governing board of Bellas Gordo Estate is aiming to do. What, what, what do they want to do? Well, during their their inaugural gala a couple of weeks ago, the the foundation board chair Dick Wolf of Law and Order fame. He talked about uh, his great love for the Frick Collection, which is out in New York. And how Bellasquaro could be could be a version of that could be the West Coast Frick, and um, I, I had to look it up. I hadn't heard of the Frick. It's it's housed in a in a, um, in a, in a, a home of a who coincidentally, and Nick pointed this out today, was another robber baron. So the Clark estate, you know, was was William Clark, who was infamous for his shenanigans, um, mining and timber reform. Yeah, yes. um, Henry C. Clark. Uh, sorry, uh, Frick. Frick. Yeah, thank you. He was, he was an industrialist um, and a very wealthy man, and he amassed this, this huge art collection that um, is still housed there, and they've collected even more over the years. So it's, it, it's, not, um, it, it's the first sort of glimpse at what they might be thinking about doing over there to, to fulfill what, what uh, Wolf called their, their, you know, their lack there. But this is Wolf, right? I mean, isn't it? I mean, there's, not, so he, there's nothing communitarian about this process that's going on. Yeah, I mean, not so far. Though what's interesting, too, is he and his wife are big collectors of Renaissance-era art. And, and, and uh, so he does have, you know, an interest in, in you know, assume some Getting some a knowledge. tax right off to put his... <laughs> yeah. To put his, yeah. Is, is the Frick Museum related to Ford Frick, former commissioner of baseball? Yeah, I see. <laughs> hey, this is Henry Clay Frick, who... In, 19, in 1889, was responsible for the Johnstown flood of Pennsylvania, where 2,200 people drowned. There's a local story. Yeah, Speaking of disaster, people. and no cell phones. No cell phones. Yeah. Were, were you invited to the gala? 
I did not get that. Catherine, were you involved <laughs> no, in that? No, that must have been on the, the way. Shocking. No, I, I, I credit you for standing outside and, and, and being the, the, the kind of the I red actually, carpet I just, I just, guy, yeah. interviewing people. <laughs> Ryan Seacrest right here. <laughs> Ryan Seacrest, that's what I was trying to think. You're always good with those cultural. Were you invited? Um, I had to coach my son that night, so I was. So you were there. invited. <laughs> sure, Jerry. I'm first on the list. Do you yes. agree with uh, with Ernie Solomon that this whole thing is a, is an outrageous ripoff and and the attorney general should be investigating it aggressively? I, I don't know if I care anymore. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, because does anyone even want to go up there? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I th I think what. <laughs> The, the issue that people have is sort of, and it's, it's going back in time, is how this thing was formed, who's leading it, and it's the whole Helene, Jeremy Lindemann. Jeremy Lindemann, yeah, but it's, Helene. It's, it's just a silly scandal, and, and let's just move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. we got a couple more minutes here. <laughs> You know, I think it's a legit question though, because when they when they presented this, when they when they it's had their supposed big to be coming this great product, public, yeah, Helene took people up. She was she was you know gave tours and said this is going to be this is going to be a great public art institution, and that's what Clark said in her in her will. That's what you said in your cover story in the end of yeah, you know? oh yeah, for sure, um, and because that's what we believed at the time too, and sh and so the fact that it's been four years, more than four years now since those promises were made. Uh, I mean, you do have to, to account for the, the IRS stuff that was going on for a few years that it was tied up in um, these sort of these back tax issues. But that, that was solved a year ago. Um, and there's, this, there's no sort of like momentum or movement seemingly around. <laughs> around Alexa, um, stand up. <laughs> Around making this what they promised they were going to make it, and, and they could have some some great plans, some some amazing ideas, but we just don't know about because. But it's just Dick Wolf, right? Dick it's Wolf. Dick, he's got there's a board, there's a board of directors, and I mean, but um, yeah, it's just. How outraged are you that Lindemann's getting been getting six figures for uh, years and years on this on a scale of one to five? Um, I learned a long time ago not to worry about things I can't control, Jerry. <laughs> what are you? <laughs> NFL guy or something? How <laughs> outraged are you on a scale of one to five? Yeah, maybe uh, zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. have, you, have you guys done anything about the Bella Squarto scandal? No. <laughs> <laughs> See? Why do you keep writing about it? I'm that? done. I'm done. That was it. Yeah. That was it. It's on a cliff and it's going to erode anyway. Yeah, the sea it, level yeah. comes. That's so a really good point. The sea level yeah. rise is going to take this as well as like the 66 acres of Oh, we didn't get to that. It's going to be a bunch of boring oh, yeah. antiques and Renaissance art. Yeah, it's going to be a nice art gallery where you are. Here. We, talked, yeah. we talked Bella Squarter, but forgot climate change Just go to Dick Wolf's house. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot for that. Thanks to, uh, <laughs> thanks to Nick Wills, Josh Molina, Catherine Barnes, and Tyler oh Hayes. <laughs> and, and thank you like for that. watching, yeah. especially on our Facebook <laughs> feed. Please visit our <laughs> website, newsmakerswithjr.com, and our YouTube channel where you'll find an archive of past shows and interviews <clears throat> should your insomnia be particularly troublesome. Thanks again to our director, J.P. Montalvo, to our crew, Lizzie, Elliot, Tristan, and Erica, and as always, to our senior high-ranking, senior high-powered executive producer, Half Freund. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.